Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemenly ladies, on this week's On the Rocks, it's our Pride Month finale as we chat literature and LGBTQ with best-selling author Stephen Rowley and his husband, Emmy winner, by the way, writer and cancer survivor, we're talking about Byron Lane, and me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass and let the drinks begin. <laughs> And most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seat, girls. It's going to be a bumpy night. The crowd is jumping tonight. Buns and bows and pantyhose on the Rocks podcast, a place where we're too glam to give a damn. Okay, because I'm a podcaster, I get all of these ads on Facebook, you know, because they're always listening. And most of it's like for microphone and tech. And it's like, bitch, I can't. I'm still trying to like program my VCR from the 80s. <laughs> um, but they're, every place is advertising these new podcast cards. And it's a deck of cards. Um, and you, if you're a podcast host, you just randomly pick a card and it has a great icebreaker question for your guest. Um <coughs> Okay, uh, if you need that, number one, you didn't do your research. Number two, you shouldn't be in podcasting. Number three, you shouldn't be in podcasting. Uh, hello. Anyway, uh, On the Rocks is coming to Uranus. <clears throat> well, kind of. I'm very excited. On the Rocks will be on the scene uh, with the nationwide nonprofit Gays in Space, and that's three A's in each, as we celebrate the 55th anniversary of Star Trek in Las Vegas for a week of panels, Star Trek celebrity meet and greets, game nights, VIP cocktail parties, and a Mars spacesuit experience. And, of course, the grand uh, finale party at Piranha Nightclub starts August 10th. Uh, I can't believe I'm going to be in Vegas for all those days. Uh, go to gazeinspace.com. And again, that's three A's in each. Uh, for more info, I'm already on this crash diet just to fit into my costumes. <laughs> I mean, Starfleet issued uniforms. Sorry. Live long and prosper, bitch. Uh, like us on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air and on Facebook, On The Rocks Radio Show. Send me an email. Book me for a wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I will show up and host. Info at On The Rocks Radio Show.com. The show is presented by Strawhead Media. You can watch and or listen to now our over 250 episodes for free at On The Rocks Radio Show.com. If you are listening, you can also watch us on Facebook Watch and on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV and on Outat.tv app. Share, subscribe, leave a comment, leave your phone number. I'm single. Not like our gentlemen that are happily married. I'm so happy for them. Um, Sean, do you have a knock-knock joke for us? Hurry up. I do, I do. Okay, we have amazing writers, so this knock-knock joke has better be good. <laughs> knock-knock. Who's there? Daisy. If this is a Daisy Fuentes joke, I'm out of here. <laughs> Daisy who? Daisy me rolling. They hating. Is this a white person thing <laughs> or a straight person thing? I can't decide. I didn't this get a single happens. laugh, but it's okay. No, I think all of us were like appreciatively like, what the hell was that? <laughs> is that a straight or a white person thing or both? I mean, I'm, it's a pretty popular song, so I feel like it's a everyone thing. How old are you? 21. So Yeah. Like Baby that's Shark like, or Shark Baby? For me, that's like a th- for me, that's like a throwback throwback, like beyond my time type thing. Oh, well, thanks so much for that. And it's still <laughs> even like before my time. Oh, God. Okay, like a new song for me is like Madonna's Vogue. It's so new. It's so chic. Have you heard it? Fresh. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Just4.Fans. It's the uh, uh, industry award-winning top site connecting content creators and their fans. You'll have more fun at Just4.Fans than you will have listening to Sean's Knock Knock jokes, especially with songs we have no clue. Sign up for free today, and they get back to the community. Okay. Let me welcome my guests for today. Not only are they accomplished authors, um, they are also lovers. And I was asking, how do we term this? Husbands! Uh, Byron Lane is an author, playwright, screenwriter, and a two-time regional Emmy Award winner from his time as a TV news journalist. His debut novel is called A Star is Bored, about an uptight celebrity assistant struggling to manage his eccentric movie star boss, inspired in part by Byron's own time as an assistant to the beloved actress, Carrie Fisher. Uh, the New York Times book re, uh, review hails wildly funny and irreverent, and People Magazine raves funny, dishy, deeply affectionate, and the force is with him. 
Lane also wrote and co-stars in the play Tilda Swinton Answers an Ad on Craigslist, a comedy you go, what the hell? Uh, it's sold out in New York, L.A., San Francisco, London, and the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, it's fantastic. Um, he also wrote and co-stars in Last Will and Testicle, an award-winning web series about his testicular cancer diagnosis, uh, which screened at festivals around the world, was called Fearless by Cosmopolitan Magazine, and named New York Television Festival Pilots to Put on Your Radar by NBC Out. He wrote and co-stars in a feature film called Her Herpes Boy. God, I thought that was my biography movie. <laughs> Starring Academy Award winner Octavia Spencer, which won Best Comedy at Comic-Con uh, and an Audience Award from the Austin Film Festival. He's a cancer survivor and sassy pants. Please welcome Byron Lane. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's too much. That's too much. Oh. Oh, it's I've not done too, too much. much. <laughs> no, you haven't. It's like, God, that's that's a <laughs> lot of stuff to have done down. at such a at such a young age. Also joined in a Stephen Rowley, uh, best selling author. I have to take a moment so I don't get emotional. Uh, Lily and the Octopus, Washington Post notable book of 2016, and the editor, named by NPR and Esquire magazine as one of the best books of 2019. His new novel, which I just finished reading, The Gunkle, was hailed by O Magazine as one of the LGBT books changing the literary landscape. All three novels are being adapted into feature films. I brought my headshot and resume, by the way. <laughs> Uh-huh. Even though I know, like, Michael <laughs> Yuri's your friend. Well, you know, cast the husky guy once, why don't you? <laughs> Rowley's fiction has been published in 20 languages. And it's really fun to see all the different covers and the different versions with the language and what they focus on for each cover. That's what I love about, like, oh, there's its caftan. There's the caftan we know and love from the gunkle. He and his husband, Byron, live in Palm Springs, which we know Palm Springs is my second home. Please welcome Stephen Rowley. Whoop, whoop. Yay. Did you hear that applause? It was louder than mine. It's, it's def- or I, what's <laughs> That's all right. I oh, think, here we go. I think yeah. your bio was longer than mine. So I know. Okay. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Well, and, and he wrote it, so it's like, well, who's, who's the writer <laughs> oh, now, bitch? Oh, the <laughs> curtain has been revealed. Now, now you can see why I wrote a book called The Editor. <laughs> oh, burn. Wow. First burn. This is our first fight. Um, <laughs> Live on air. Yeah. Right. Let's throw down. Yeah. Let's call TMZ. But I want to know how how did you first meet, and was it love at first sight? I do feel that way. We met uh, on OK Cupid, and I re- did you really? Yeah, and I vividly remember on our first date, Steve rounding the corner in yellow pants and having this reaction, this thought of like, oh, okay, yeah. It was the pants. It, well, it hello, part, yellow part pants. It's like gray sweatpants. Like, you know what religion the pants. is. <laughs> yeah. oh, the banana man. It wasn't hey. the color of the, the pants. <laughs> so what was it on OK Cupid that you matched? Was it like his look? Was it what was in his bio? He was super handsome, yes. Um, but his bio was very funny. And uh, I don't know if you read his books. He's, I know. He's, he's, he's great, funny. a great writer. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And uh, I also had like my uh, red flag things that I always look for. Like, how do they feel about uh, women being forced to shave their legs? Like they had all these questions on OkCupid like that. Do they really? Yeah. Like that or like questions about abortion or religion. And uh, so I always go to those to check. And he like passed all those. And I was like, That's all right. interesting. This I'd be like, none of your good. business, OkCupid. I, it's I a lot of questions. I yeah. remember that. I remember thinking like, oh, maybe there'll be 50 or 100. And I I grabbed, so I grabbed a bottle of wine. I started answering questions, and then I hit the hundred mark, and it kept going and going yep. and going. Yep. I think I went up to almost a thousand. And the more you you don't have to answer, but the more you answer, the better the match is, supposedly. But. And they're probably like waiting through like who really wants to date because like yeah. Yeah. you know on Grinder it's just you have to put in a few yeah. positions and then like you're ready to go right. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, right. here it was like, what do you think of all out nuclear war? Would that be interesting? And I'm like, well, it wouldn't be dull. You See, know, like, but it's like, how, how do you, you answer? Love that? How do you, yeah. how yeah. do you answer? Who knows? But anyway, here we are. And, and so far, no war. No war. Now, both of you were on this app because you weren't fighting. Well, we, I know what dating in, in Los Angeles is like. But is that why you were just frustrated with what was happening in the dating or you didn't have time to do all that? You just wanted like to do your research well, for me, it, it sort of, I never really knew dating any other way, to be honest. I had jobs before that where I worked in the middle of the night, so it was always hard to meet people. Oh, that's right. You were a, a nighttime yep. uh, news journalist. Yep. And then I worked for Carrie Fisher, and we would travel a lot. And uh, so I'd be out of town for two weeks. And then when I would be in town, I was like, I got to line these guys up. I think this is a numbers game. And so it was a little bit. And so OKCupid made it easy to do that. Well, and I know, you know, Stars Board is is inspired by your life, but I loved that kind of section because we, we get to see some of that life and being in the entertainment business in L.A. too. It's like, I feel your, your, your pain. And sometimes it seems like so much time has gone by because you don't have time to really pay attention to yourself because you're always working. Yep. And we think career, 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 where love is just as important as career. 
Or you could be happily single, but like you have to know that that's 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 what your 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 game is. Yeah. How, how about you dating in, in in LA? Well, it was just you know we've been together a, a little while now, so yeah. so like uh, apps were I, I feel like kind of brand new, like even. Um, you know, smartphones were, were relatively new. It's hard to remember, like, how quickly things have changed. But, like, OK Cupid was, um, you know, sort of the, the it was game prestige. in town. Yeah. It, it, well, yeah. If you were if you were serious about dating, I think that was, a you know, that was probably one of our better options. I don't know. I, I remember the AOL chat rooms, like M for M Los Angeles. Yeah. And then to send a pic, it was like, eh. by then you <laughs> yeah. had fallen asleep or yeah. watched Let's film. just say Tilda Swinton wasn't the only one who answered an ad on Craigslist. <laughs> oh. oh. Sometimes I miss Craigslist, you know, because yeah. it's, I, I don't know, it has a little nostalgia to it. Oh, absolutely. Except most times it never worked because you're like, <laughs> Wow, that's not what I ordered. <laughs> <laughs> What's the return policy? Yeah. Um, and I have to know what the dynamic is of two writers living in the same house, sharing financial responsibilities, you know, sharing sharing pets, sharing this life. What's a typical writer's day like for you? Do you have like the cute desk like facing each other, oh, or is it, like uh, separate wings? What's happening? Can you imagine if we had bankers' desks like just facing each other? I have fantasies about it, but I don't think it would work. I don't think it would work either. Well, I'll just let's let's like sort of walk this one backwards because I'm going to talk about the past year plus, you know, when we've been in the pandemic and whatnot, where I I have loved. Some people think two writers in the same household would be a nightmare, but I've actually liked it because I have writer friends who are married to high powered attorneys or corporate executives and they come home and suddenly they're working from home and in their space and they're on loud conference calls all day, you know, shouting throughout the house. I, I don't know how anyone would get it would get any writing done that. So so having two writers in the house at least is quiet. Yeah, and I get up early, so I get up usually up around six, and so I'll sometimes do a little writing then, and go for a long walk, and Steve gets up a little later, and so we kind of Judgment. stagger and do our thing. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> are you like in separate wings of the house writing? Steve has a wing. Um, what directions? <laughs> I want to say it's an east wing, but I don't know my directions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he he's in uh, in a guest room, and I prefer to be just in the living room and. Um, that would be tough for me, I, I, I think, because yeah. all the distraction and Golden Girls and Judge Judy. Oh, like, all the <laughs> happiness. Yes. Yeah. No, I try to I try to get focused. I mean, a big part of it is really just staying in the chair and being disciplined and getting your word count and all that stuff. Now, when you're in the middle of it, do you kind of feel that's happening with the other person to be like, OK, now's not a time to be flirty or let's go see a movie. Let's just let them be. Uh, yeah, I was, look, another advantage too is I think like it's it can be a very internal like occupation. We're very much you know sort of in our own minds sometimes, and you, it's not necessarily something you can turn off at the end of the day. Like if you're in it trying to figure something out, um, you know it's hard to just stop at six and let, let's focus on dinner. So I think right. we're forgiving of each other too. Um, we understand when uh, the other person needs space and quiet time because they're they're figuring something out. Yeah, and Steve's much better at sheltering himself in the back room than I. I mean, I, I bother him all the time at every hour for anything. Uh, or I'll just eat whenever I want. Like, I'm not going to, you know, if he's busy working in the zone or something. Well, and you've you've been through writing the novel type of process. And obviously, you've been writing for years and years. But the novel process is much, much different. How do your creative approaches or your process differ from each other? Are you sitting at just bouncing ideas? Are you storyboarding everything? Are there post-it notes everywhere? I'm a post-it note kind of guy. I'm a I'm a go on long walks and think it through kind of guy, mm. an outline person. Um, sometimes we'll pitch ideas to each other, and I think we, you know, it's just like getting notes from anyone. Like sometimes Steve will pitch me an idea, and I'll be like, ugh. That's not for me. I always feel bad doing that. Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't it harder to hear that from people that you love? It's like, bitch, who asked you? And it's like, well, right. you did. Yeah, you have to become very good very quickly about understanding like what he's asking for here. So is he legitimately asking for notes and suggestions? Or is he just wanting encouragement and, and, and praise and validation at it's like, that do moment? Do I look fat and in it's this? Like, like, it's right, that yeah, 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 he yeah. wants He wants validation. Thank you. I do. <laughs> I, I, I want to know. No, I'm just yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good notes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you have to sort of get a read on the situation. Yep. But, I mean, if anybody's going to see your not best work, it should be kept in the home before oh, it's Oh, and we're definitely each other's first, first readers. Yeah, and I know I can sure. trust Steve to be honest. Is this ready for an agent? Is this yeah. ready for an editor? And uh, and I think you can trust me to do that, too. Yeah, and I need the notes because I'm more of a pantser. So you're an outliner. Like, we'll have a whole wall hates in it. our house covered in Post-it notes or recipe when cards. When is this or, coming oh, down? Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> but I'm more of, like, fly by the seat of my pants. Like, I really 
I, I don't want to know what's going to happen that day because it makes it more exciting for me to sit in the chair. And if, if I don't know what's going to happen, and then there's a sense of discovery that day. And, and if I can do something that, uh, that really sort of tickles me, then that it, <laughs> it sounds like I'm procrastinating. It just uh, tickles me. But that uh, is a but, big part of being a writer is the procrastination. And it's like, today was just not a good day for yeah. writing. Oh, well, tomorrow's another day well you have, you have to be forgiving of yourself too because mm. i think like if you're down on yourself the next day for having a bad day the day before then you're gonna have another bad day because you're not in the right frame of mind so i also like to say sometimes writing is just going to the grocery and observing wacky characters yeah. and and living life and hearing a story and uh writing it down and that kind of thing now what's an idea that either one of you had that was like that was awful and like later on you're like oh yeah you're right oh my gosh uh, I feel like they happen a lot. I'll tell you, we, uh, I mean, for, wow. from me, from me, I, I'm full of bad ideas. Um, but mostly what happens, I think, are little moments that I think, uh, oh, let's include this in something. So like we just uh, recently had dinner with a friend and she was telling us she had a farm and with sheep and she would uh, bathe the sheep in woolite. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, oh that's, my God. that belongs in a book. Of like, course yeah. it does. You know, so it's mostly like little moments like and that. And sometimes we'll have to fight over details like that. If we're at the same dinner party and hear the same thing, right. you know, I'll be like, wait, that's mine. I'm using that. <laughs> I'm using that. Yeah. And, and God help any of you who are uh, friends or related to writers because we <laughs> – we're sponges, yeah. And so be careful what you say. Well, I know Stephen. Uh, when you wrote the editor, it's it's kind of autobiographical. There was some uh, from your friends that was like, "Hey, that was me," and uh, they were the happiest with how they were portrayed, or they felt. Uh, yeah, it's it was really Lily and the Octopus, my first novel, that was the most autobiographical, and it's it's strange because um, you know, well, several odd things. One, you you change names as best as you can, although there is a character named Byron at the end, and we had a conversation I about. Know, so I was like, oh, that's that's how it happened. Changing the name, but there was a Lord Byron poem I wanted to quote, and it just mm -hmm. didn't work if the character was not named Byron. But but weird things can happen from that because I remember my publisher at the time, Simon and Schuster, was putting out a book club guide, and one of the questions was what do you think of the Byron character? Do you think he and the narrator have any future together? And I was like, oh no, women in book clubs oh, drinking no. boxed white wine yeah. are going to weigh in on our <laughs> relationship. Ages, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting, you know, sometimes people are mad that they're not included. Sometimes people That's don't recognize themselves. Like, who is that guy? That guy was a real asshole. Who was that? And I'm like, mm, I think it was you. Um, but, uh, you know, so people have different reactions to it. Um, and writing the editor was inspired by by things that I had said about my mother in, in Lily and the Octopus, which I thought were really beautiful, but they were true. They were a little, you know, sort of unvarnished. Um, but but really lovely because I think you know human flaws are interesting to write about. But she did not t take kindly to them at the time. She's now come around to that. But but um, you know so so I, it inspired the editor, which is about a young man uh, who wrote an autobiographical book about his mother, which is acquired by Jacqueline Onassis when she was a book editor at Doubleday in the in the in the early nineties. So um, so one thing you know sometimes those reactions in inspire new ideas. And I think that's what I loved about the Gunko. You know, it's this it's this beautiful, charming, positive story. But every character has their flaws, even our main character, the hero. Um, and so, it, like you said, it's an unvarnished version. That's what we all are. And so when reading that, we need sincerity in what we're writing, especially in today's age with all this flashy, flashy stuff that's kind of CGI and surfacy. When you sit down to actually touch a book and read page by page, it has to affect you. It has to be real. Otherwise, it's just lost in the noise. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I worry about that now, too, because perfect people are really boring to write about. They're especially boring to read about. And so, you know, in this day and age when, you, when, you know, everything's so PC and you want people to behave in a certain way or you I worry about having characters that will be canceled sometimes. And sometimes I've had a few readers feedback. You know, I can't believe Patrick said this, you know, in the in the gunkle. And I'm like, you know, I can't believe he said it either. But it, but if he were so perfect and so polished, that's uh, that's not interesting to read about. So. One of the questions we got, you know, everybody kind of has an idea. It's like, you know, my life should be a book or I'm going to write a book someday. And you hear this over like my friends that I've had for 20 years. You know, they keep saying to write, write a book. It's like, OK, how does one just sit down and write a book? Um, and I know it's kind of come from like screenplays that you had uh, sold and, you know, you were a journalist and have written plays. Do you just decide? Well, I know uh, Lily and the Octopus kind of started as a short story. Um, I think you wrote it like in a hundred days. Uh, the the novel version, yeah, yeah. 
so you just sit down and you're like, okay, this this is my book writing, and you stretch and you get your snacks ready, and this is what's on your mind. Or do you think it should just happen more organically? And if it happens for some people, it should happen. Or should you challenge yourself to say, sit down and do it? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll let I'll let you answer that, but I just want to go back to the previous question before because sometimes the the ideas aren't bad, but they're not necessarily a novel. They're not necessarily mm. a book. So sometimes we go to each other, we have great ideas, but then you sit down to start writing it and you run out of steam. You realize mm. like, oh, the sheep farm where they bathe them in wool light is not actually a full, you know, 400 page book. So it's a Hallmark Christmas movie. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. You should write that by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The process is so different for everyone. I generally just stick to keep going is as my advice to myself and to others. So if you, if you have an idea, go for it, like get it down, be disciplined, um, and try to try to express what's in your heart. And, uh, so I'm all about encouragement. The media push that both of you had ha have had for your for your books, the interviews, the book signings, it's this huge success that we see, um, not only from your celebrity friends, you know, posting oh. about it, but we're talking about reviews from every major media source. Uh, they've both been wild hits. They've gone viral. Like if, if your literature was a YouTube video, they've gone viral. You can't just bake, bank on that. How does that even happen? Is it the, the publisher's work to do that press and really get the book in front of people who matter? Or is it just having great content that gets out there? How do you make uh, a book a success the way that both of you have, have had it? What does our friend say? Uh, it's two parts luck and one part hard work or something yeah. like that. And so it really is a little bit of luck. Um, but I think Steve and I are both kind of media savvy. Um, Steve uh, studied communications and film, and I, I studied journalism and, and media and all that. And so I think there's this sense with us of, um, you know, I know how to write a headline, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so I think it's a little bit of that, but it's it's some luck too. Yeah, and 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 so when we've had like a little help, so so I you know wrote this story where Jacqueline Onassis was a was a main character. You know, there's so much fascination about the Kennedys and Jackie O and all this stuff. So you can lean on the subject a little bit to get you some attention sometimes, and certainly, um, you know, your relationship with Carrie Fisher was an object of fascination uh, for many. So so we're more lucky than some where we've had a, a jumping off. Uh, Point. Uh, you know, with the Gunkle, there's a there's a guy where a, a, a gay man with a caftan and a martini on the cover. I mean, who doesn't want to read about that? So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the gay characters in, in both of your books. What I love is that uh, it's not written like gay book, gay character. It's a part of the story, and there's all these other facets to these characters' lives. And I think it's kind of set the tone for what we're seeing in Hollywood. Before the gay Hollywood movie was the gay Hollywood movie that would just hit you over the head, and it had to be either super gay or super tragic, and that's all we got to see. And I think Hollywood is now incorporating different story parts. Like, oh yeah, they happen to be, even in the commercials that we've been seeing, yep. it's like, oh, there's a gay couple, but it's not like, this is the gay J.C. Penny commercial. Right. It's just part of that right. story, and that's what I think both of you done so well um, in your books. Now, who is your audience? Um, because it's uh, centered around a gay character um, in, in, in all of your books. Um, so who do you think your audience is? Wow, that's such a good question. <laughs> I can tell you, for, for me, I, I have not thought about that. Um, I mean, I, there have been moments where I think, uh, uh, oh, should, should I even, should I have a gay flag on the cover? When I was doing um, Tilda Swinton Answers an Ad on Craigslist, and we were in Edinburgh. Um, I wanted people to know it was a, it was a, you know centered around some gay characters, and uh, so we put a gay flag on the flyers so people could. Right. But we didn't do it on the book, and I don't know. I I uh, I don't I didn't think about it. I just I just knew I wanted to write a book where there was a character who I recognized, and those are the books I like to read. And I think the Gunkel hit it out of the park with that, and Lily and the Octopus, and and others where you, just as you mentioned, there's a character and th he just happens to be gay, and he's living his life, and it, it looks like me and feels like me. Yeah. Well, you know, I first came out in, in the, I'm old as the hills, so I came out in the early 1990s, 1991 or so. And you're right, gay stories were very, I, they were either coded, you know, they weren't outright about gay characters, or they were sort of hidden in the shadows, or they were very tragic. Yeah. Um, and so I feel such joy in being able to write uh, queer characters now where it's not about, it's not a tragedy, it's not... Um, you know, a failing of their life to be gay. And it's not a coming out story either because I, I shouldn't be writing the coming out story anymore. I think, um, you know, particularly for, for, for white, cisgendered, um, you know, gay men of a certain, I feel like, like Love, Simon maybe closed the door on that and it's time to hand the baton to, uh, you know, our trans brothers and sisters and, um, you know, um, people of, of other, co you know, colors and communities and religions coming out, you know. Uh, so, 
I really appreciate writing about queer characters in different stages of their lives and different who are not stereotypes and all that. Yeah, yeah, but it, but on the, the the flip side of that too, because I think my audience is largely women. I mean, the, the 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 sad fact is like women are the fiction buying audience largely, women, women and gay men. So that you know that's really fantastic. But um, you know sometimes people just say to me, "Oh, I love your books because they're not gay," and I I actually take offense at that. Like it, it, you can go too far in the other direction. I'm like my novels are absolutely gay novels because they're informed by my <laughs> empathy, my politics, my worldview, my sense of humor, my pop cultural references. Yes. Those are all stemmed from my experience as an out gay man. So I think the books, while, you know, maybe they don't I mean there's a lot of hardcore sex in them, but but they're they're very queer. And I have to say, back to your point where you said, you know, I, I shouldn't be telling the coming out story. What we've learned during this month on the show is everybody has shared their coming out story. And there's still, you know, that white boy in some small town with a population of 300 that does need to see. Oh, no, the a coming out story is still important. I'm just saying, I, as a 50 year old white man, I should, you know, it's, I want someone else to tell their story now, their coming out story now. This is, I mean, th this, I this kind of chat just, you know, just gets me. Um, uh, and th there's more and more success. Did either one of you have any trepidation? And were you an out TV uh, journalist when, when you were no. writing your stuff? Uh, no. Uh, when I was working in TV, I was very scared of being out. This was in uh, 2000 to 2005. And we think, oh, that's so recent. But number one, it's about 20 years ago, yeah. you know, um, and it was a whole different culture. Yeah, I, but I, I was scared about a lot of things. I was uh, I was insecure that I looked too young. Um, was I? We still look too young. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, now I'll take it. Yeah. I'm about to be 43. It feels good. Don't rub it in. Oh yeah. my gosh. So yeah, I was uh, I was really insecure about that and scared that it would uh, hurt hurt that career. I'm ashamed to say all that now. I wish I was uh, more courageous, but. Well, no, I mean, it wasn't a safe. And, you know, the voice that you have now, maybe if you would have come out then and your career wouldn't have progressed or you wouldn't have learned all of that, yeah. you wouldn't have this voice that you have. Yeah. You know, the question is, should we expect, you know, gay performers to have to come out? Is is it their duty? And it's like, well, no, everybody ha will have their time or not have their time, but it's it's different uh, for everybody. Um you know, we've talked to Stan Zimmerman, who wrote season one of The Golden Girls, and we think Golden Girls is the gayest show around, and he had to be in that closet that mm. whole season wow. for one of the most <laughs> iconically gay shows, and yeah. it's just a sad uh, testament to what the environment was. Of course, he was writing it in the 80s in the height of the you know AIDS mm -hmm. epidemic, mm -hmm. so you know people were afraid to touch your pencil if you were gay, and th that was j just the truth. Uh. Um, but I want to know what it was like working, and I know you worked like in the night shift um, as a TV journalist. Uh, what was that kind of life like? What did you like about it? What did you absolutely hate about it? The best thing about it was uh, there was no homework. I could show up in my pajamas. Really? It doesn't didn't matter what I looked like. I would sit at my. This is when I was a news writer here in Los Angeles, and uh, I would just write. and uh, And then when the show was over, I went home and I was done. The hardest part about that was uh, exhaustion, and you couldn't have a life. It was hard yeah. to do that. And then when I was on air in Las Vegas, that was very depressing. I would show up at midnight with my little necktie on, get in a live truck, drive around from crime scene to crime scene, listening to a police scanner in the truck, uh, peeing behind 7-Elevens because no one would let us in because everyone's scared of crime. And there's 10 other yeah. people peeing behind 7-Eleven oh because that's what you do when you go to Vegas. That's right. <laughs> uh, was that your social life at that Yeah, time? That, was, that, that was the truth. That was my social life. It was really hard to, uh, hard to have a real life uh, working those hours. And so it was a little bit depressing. So I was glad to, I was glad to jet out here to L.A. But when you have a job like that, there's always this timeline, like this time crunch. It's like, get the story out now, do oh, yeah. it, do it, do it, do it. That kind of pressure, you don't just leave at the office, even though you're like, okay, I can go home. It's this kind of a, adrenaline. Yeah, it was my whole life. I would, so, so I worked for the CBS affiliate in Vegas, and they had another channel that would replay all the newscasts. So I would do like six live shots every morning, and then I would go home and watch all of them and like make notes and critique myself. Oh, would you really? Yeah, but that, you know, I'm hard on myself. So it was a little bit of, it probably would have been better for my mental health to not do that, mm -hmm. but but that was my life. I'm picturing you like Annette Benning in in yes. uh, American Beauty. Oh, like, I will sell this. I will sell this story today. I will sell this story. Today. <laughs> there was, yes, that's how it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, did people start to recognize you from being on TV? No, I mean, uh, my friends who knew me thought it was cool, but I never, I never uh, hit the 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 point where um, I was just like recognized in in the store. Now, I was an, a weekend anchor in a small town, uh, Alexandria, Louisiana, before Vegas. And I was doing a live shot at some festival or something, and some guy came up to me and was like, uh, 
my 14 year old daughter will be so jealous I get to meet you. She loves watching you anchor. And then I just remember staring at him and then he goes, oh, if I told her this, she'd be as red as you are right now. Because I just was blushing. I didn't know what to do. It was all so weird. So every now and then in the small town it would happen. But in Vegas, I think it was just too big. So back to your question, who's your audience? It's 14 year old girls. <laughs> 14 year old girls yeah. love me. There you go. Hey, you, you could do worse. That's right. They know how to use those machines. That's yep. right. <laughs> now, what was your end goal when you were doing that? Did you want to be like the main anchor someday? Oh, yeah. I, I worked with Hoda Kotb in New Orleans and uh, that was my dream to, to have a job like like she had working for Dateline or Today. Or and, with Kathy uh, Lee. I mean, drinking who, wine on drinking national wine TV, on TV in the morning. Who love Kathy Lee? Yeah. Love Kathy Lee. Yeah. I grew up on Kathy Lee and Regis. Yes. That was my mom would tape it, and when she would come home oh. from her second job, that's what we would watch I every single night. Every yeah. time we say Kathy Lee, we have to take a drink. Oh, cheers! Yes. Cheers! We have to slap the table yeah. and, mm -hmm. and then talk about Cody. Of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was that transition then? You finally said, and you, you won two re regional Emmys for that. Mm -hmm. But there was that point in your life that you were like, "I'm done with that. Yeah. Th this was too much." Your kind of goal then shifted, or did you think you were going to get to that in a different way? No, I when I moved to L.A. and was off air and just writing news, I was looking for a way out. And uh, I started getting into uh, film and, and producing and writing and all that stuff and auditioning. And I was doing some acting. And uh, a friend of mine who worked for Carrie Fisher's agent at the time... Uh, reached out to me and was like, hey, would you ever consider working for Princess Leia? She's looking for someone who's a writer. I think you two would get along. And I thought, you know what? If I'm going to leave this journalism career, who better to go leave it for but then Carrie Fisher? So I was like, yes, let's meet her. Let's do this. Let's see what happens. This is the weirdest thing about living in L.A. is that your career has no direct path. There's no yeah. guidebook. And if you say no to something, you, you, you just never know. You hear all these stories that give you panic because somebody happened to be at the right place at the right time or happened to go to this party or happened to go yep. meet somebody for a job that they weren't even interested. I mean, it, yep. it, it's so weird. Um, I'm still sitting at the Schwab soda counter hoping yeah, to be right? discovered. Yeah. Yes. It's like, do you need another burger? Yes, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, and even that didn't really happen for her. And you have a quote out there, which I love, and it kind of keeps me inspired. Oh, tell me. You know, I like to sound smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, we talk about the success of Lily and, and the octopus, um, that it was such a big hit. And it's not this overnight success. And the quote you said was, you know, nobody talks about the 15 years it took for me to get to that point, selling scripts or writing this or, you know, hitting the pavement. And even this story, as as popular as it has become, um, you sent it to like 30 literary agents who said no. So at that point, any writer would be like, OK, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to, you know, go write uh, whatever. But you kept at it. Um, can you share the story of how Lily came to actually fruition? Because I love the, the story. Oh, sure. And it's true for any artist out here, by the way. You know, anybody who suddenly pops on the scene, usually, you know, unless unless you're like a, maybe a 12-year-old YouTube sensation who, who breaks then, through with it, you know, right. and gets a recording contract or something. But, but you know, there's, there's incredible training. You know, there's practicing your art. There is, um, you know, studying and... Um, Years hitting the pavement and auditioning or, or rejection. Rejection is such a huge part of the business. But yeah, that's true. So Lily and the Octopus is about you know a man who wakes up one morning and thinks you know imagines he sees a small octopus stuck to his dog's head, and it was about my having lost uh, a dog. She passed away from from cancer, and I knew immediately what I was writing about was attachment and how difficult it can be to let go. So it made sense to a certain degree to me at least to have this tentacular kind of. Metaphor, but but call New York publishing agents and say, do you want to read my book about a dog with an octopus stuck to her head? And uh, you know, you will hear crickets. I'm, I'm, mis I'm mixing animal metaphors here, but but um, <laughs> it's a zoo. It's a zoo, you know. Or you know, I would try to pitch it different ways in Hollywood. You know, this it's this meets that or, or whatnot. But what what I learned is sometimes too is not just um, that you have to write something great or. So sometimes you have to learn how to talk about your art in a way that engages others, uh, too. And that was certainly true with Lily. So I started pitching it as as it's about a, a man who's at a point where he's stuck in his life. And it's about how the obstacles in our way are either outright imagined or greatly exaggerated. And, and how we need to accept about ourselves to be able to move forward on from them and that's learning how to talk about what I'd written in a way that was in, engaging and make it more universal for others is I think what helped me break through uh, and there was interest and then all of a sudden you have Simon and Schuster uh, saying here's here's your 
deal. Yeah, well, I you know it it was I was I was proud of it as a piece of writing, but I knew that it was a very you know perhaps odd story to tell. Um, you know, but it was Byron who encouraged me. I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll I'll put it out. Maybe I'll self publish and and um, you know I'll be, always be able to point to it on my shelf and say that's something I did and I'm I'm proud of. But through a series of events, Byron encouraged me to get a a, a freelance editor because uh, you know. F- Self-publishing runs the gamut. There's very professional stuff. There's also very amateurish stuff. We've all had those friends. It's like, look, my book was just published. Like, oh, that's great. And like, the pages are falling out, have it printed there. And it's like 30 pages long and you read it and it's like, that was the worst thing ever Yeah, and then sometimes there's Twilight, which is also not great, but, but, um, you know, breaks through in a huge way. So so self-publishing is, you know, it it really runs the gamut. So I did, I got an editor and she she was the one who immediately told me, no, uh, you shouldn't self-publish this. I think there's an audience for this. And she helped me get it through the door at Simon & Schuster. And then, and then all of a sudden it snowballed from there you know this book that no one wanted to publish was suddenly uh you know uh, their lead title for the summer and uh, translated in 20 languages and there's a movie in the works and so this this thing that i thought it's so specific it's just how i feel on the inside all these people from around the world were connecting with uh this story all of a sudden and i think that i think that's truly important and i try to tell people you know if you have a story in you and you don't see other people telling it. You know, I'm not the only person, by the way, who said that. You know, you know, Toni Morrison, wonderful, brilliant minds, much greater than mine, have said this too. You know, you be the one to write it, and that's sort of what I love about writing and, and publishing. Um, and you've been publishing actually uh, since you were in grade school. You would write these these books, and your dad would kind of put them together, staple them, and you would do a little cover page, and and that's kind of... Are you going to say my dad's on the air right now? with us? Joining, live. joining <laughs> us live. From, uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Once I learned that you could make multiple copies of something, like that was... That was exciting that's, that's, as That was kid, so right? exciting. You yeah. would come home, you know, and it's, uh, t- to me, you know, and I'm sure this is not the case, but, you know, they still felt warm from the, you know, photocopier, or, and, you know, they were collated and stapled in a certain way and I thought oh once I realized the power of having more than one copy of something I wrote then you know it was all over for me I think my destiny was written mm. and your parents were supportive right from the from the get-go um, uh, yes or no oh sure yeah I, I think there's you know certain things I've said in my writing over the that that it's taken a moment to to adjust to but um, you know as I said they're, they're now yeah all my my biggest fans so now, when Byron wanted to write A Star is Bored, were you like, Ooh, let me tell you how it's done? Or were you like, I think this is a great idea? How, how, did, that, how did that conversation happen? Uh, no, I think, you know, I think it's a, you know, I immediately I thought, you know, this is absolutely a book. He shared some pages that he had written. Obviously, he's written before. He's such an incredible voice. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I, you know, felt protective in a small way because I know rejection is such a huge part and it's it's hard to connect the pathways sometimes and find and you know I'm sure there was a little bit of feeling in our house like lightning had struck with Lily does it strike twice in in the in the same house and and yet he managed to he managed to do it and how how have you dealt with that pressure you know Lily a big hit and it's like okay let's do another one and it's like wow let's let's do another one how does that play on you when you're sitting down? You're like, okay, this this has got to be as good. It's got to be better. Uh, have a lot to, to to follow up. How does that play? Yeah, in, well, in, in your well, mind? if anybody's listening who has writing aspirations, I like to be very honest about this because Simon and Schuster rejected my second novel, the editor. And See, I'd um, love to hear stories like this, and I think we all need to hear it. You keep at it. You keep you at it. Keep, keep at going. it. And yeah. I thought, oh, I have arrived, you know, yeah. with this novel, and I was feeling very good about myself. And you know, it's a splash, and it's a bestseller, and a, you know, it's all over the world. And I'm getting messages from readers who've really connected from it. And Simon and Schuster read my next book, and they were like, thanks, but no thanks and I think from their point of view they wanted me to deliver perhaps another dog book Um, and you know I didn't think I'd written a dog book naively I thought I'd written a book about grief Um, and so there are plenty of writers who have brilliant careers writing slightly different versions of the same thing again and again and again shade Uh, but uh, (laughs) especially today's age it's like a reboot of a reboot of a reboot right exactly but I didn't I didn't want to be that kind of artist and so I but I had to really think do I listen is there value in what they're saying should I write something else and I thought about it for almost a year before I decided no I'm going to sever these ties walk away gamble on myself again because if anyone if I had asked anyone's permission to write a book about a dog with an octopus you know on her head, no one would have said that was a good idea. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I just gambled on myself again. And fortunately, I got scooped up by, you know, another publisher. But, you know, these are, it's, it's, a, it's a perseverance. You know, we're either artists, we're either in this to make the art 
um, or you know, or it's time to do this as a hobby, and uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that too. But um, you know, it was, it was sort of decision time. Am I going to double down on myself or? or let, let this dream go. I heard someone say that you can't be a doctor if you're scared of blood. Mm -hmm. And I think similar with rejection and being an artist, like you can't, I mean, it can still suck and you can still think it's gross, but yeah, you can't have those bad days. Yeah, 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 yeah. And have some of those failures as, as a doctor as, yep. as well. But here's where we're gonna take note. Oh, a doctor afraid of blood. That's a great, uh, that's <laughs> a great right, story. Right, Let's right, argue right. over that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, Stephen, writing uh, Lily, uh, it came out of your heart grief with, with your own loss. Um, we're going to talk about grief a, a little bit later because I want to bring in themes from both of your books and fr from your personal life. Um, and I think the beauty of Lily is that depending where you are and who you are in, in your life, I think it has different shades and aspects. The fact that you said it's about a man overcoming obstacles and the experience that I'm having literally right now with a dog with mm -hmm, cancer, mm -hmm. it's about a man and, and his dog. Yeah. Um, and then it could just be about grief as well, regardless of if it was a dog or um, and then it's a beautiful story of, of imagery and how you can how you can personify obstacles in life with 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 animals or with other sure. people. And I love that aspect of it as well, because, you know, cancer is such a scary thing. Putting it in a physical kind of face like an octopus, it's almost easier to deal with. And you have something to be angry at that has form and you, you can take out your aggression on that or, or have this idea of fighting it. Because um, we know, oh, and you can speak on this obviously, is that we know that your mindset is just as powerful as the medicine and and that. I mean, you have to have the mindset, otherwise there, 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 there's no point to that. But was it hard to sit and write the story and kind of revisit that experience and that grief all over again? Um, uh, you, that's interesting. Well, first of all, the way you described the book, it sounds really good. Maybe I should reread it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's oh, been a, it's been I a while. I heard they're making a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and maybe, Michael Yuri's going to play every part, by the way. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe yes. yeah. He does. Well, he does the audio book. He's brilliant in it. Uh, no, I love Michael. He's he's friend of the show. Yeah, love him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I will say, like, ironically, I, I wrote this before Byron's own cancer diagnosis. So there certainly were things from the book that I was thinking about, you know, again, as as he went through that. In terms of reliving the grief that I had with the dog, you know, like, to me now, you know, I, we, I don't have Lily's ashes. I chose not to, to sort of bring her home in that way. But I have this book, which is a beautiful... Are you judging me? Are you? No, no, no. I, 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 I think it's so fascinating. Um, I didn't experience real grief until the, the last two years of my life. Uh, up until then, I had been blessed. Mm. I didn't have this kind of grief. I didn't have this kind of association. And because of that grief, I can't hear enough stories about how people deal yeah. with life after death. I have become an atheist through this. Not an angry atheist. I'm not m mad at people who are still religious. I just, there was this emptiness that wasn't yeah. there. Uh, and so it's very interesting that you didn't yeah, keep. I think I was in ashes. shock. I think, you know, they gave me 72 hours to decide what do you want to, and I don't know, I don't know, 72 hours. I didn't know what to do, and I just sort of let the decision slide. But now what I have is this beautiful book, which is a catalog of memories of our time together. And I'm so grateful I wrote it. it as painful as it was at times to actually write that, the sad truth is that memory fades. And I would advise this for anyone grieving. Write down happy memories. Even if you're not a writer, it's okay. Make a list mm -hmm. because all those beautiful details will be of great comfort to you later, and they, and they fade over time. I, I think that's that's such a great point. Uh, we, we lost my grandma two years ago, and I was raised by my mom and grandma. It wasn't mm -hmm. like I would go visit my grandma every now and then. Like she 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 was my constant, one of my best friends. Um, and you have this fear when somebody dies that you're going to forget. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do. Some memories start to slip, and it's it's this panic that you have, or you have a dream, and you don't remember everything. It's like you're grasping it like smoke that's fading away. And so I think that's that's such a uh, great point. Um, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for your own loss, but I'm sh th I'm sure there are beautiful even details about her. You know what she wore, what she smelled. Like, you know all these things that you uh, uh, I write them down. It's really important to have them. Well, my mom is actually writing a, a book, and I encourage her just write for ten minutes today. Mm, absolutely. You know, she's yeah. writing about so much her own cancer journey. Um, Stephen, I have to tell you, uh, I get very involved in in the books that I read. I got very upset with you, um, not to give. Well, I, you have to read uh, Lily and, and the Octopus, but there's a moment where items are kind of put aside, and it's like, okay, I got so angry because I was like, how dare you? put that stuff away out of sight out of mind and then continue with your life going on 
you know, you didn't just sit there for the rest of the book and the book ends like that. It's yeah, I will say, on. like, you know, without giving anything away, you know, what I what I really admire about I was going to say people who love animals, but it's true of people who love and, mm-hmm. you know, like we have big, beautiful hearts and we love fully and our hearts are broken and we feel grief and we heal. And what's so resilient about people is that so many of us get right back to the end of the line and sign up to do it all over again, whether it be with another, you know, adopting another dog in need or, you know, after one, the end of one relationship, opening ourselves up to a new love. And so how one great love can, can open you up to, to another love again, too. I think it's, you know, an important theme to explore. All right, let's talk about Cancer Schmancer. Woo! Cancer Schmancer. <laughs> Along this note, uh, Byron, you have been um, uh, beautiful enough to share your cancer journey on social media through your own writings. Um, you know, I really bonded with you, even though, you know, you were going through your chemo and your process. I was, every day I was looking up and, you know, this energy that you had was, was so positive. Um, but I can't imagine that's how you always felt. Your diagnosis of cancer at such an early age, we think everybody's first reaction and probably even to your face was like, oh, my God, you're so young. Mm. You know, the rest of us are worrying about, you know, drinks at the Abbey and, you know, breaking up with you or this hookup. You get this diagnosis um, and not just like a simple diagnosis. I want to know if you don't mind sharing um, how you noticed there, there was kind of an issue with your body and what that doctor's appointment must have been like. So it was uh, 2015, and I felt a small lump on a testicle while I was peeing, and uh, I was just kind of exploring. (laughs) Uh, And then, uh, like, a a few weeks later, it was bigger. And uh, so I made an appointment with the urologist, and he was like, it's probably testicular cancer. We won't know for sure until we take the testicle out, but uh, we have to do it. And, oh, they checked my blood, and uh, for certain cancers, uh, your blood gives off markers, signals that, that something's wrong. So my tumor markers were elevated, and uh, so that was that. But it was all very matter-of-fact. I mean, at the time, in 2015, I wasn't sure if I'd have to do chemo then, and so I was really nervous about uh, losing my hair and how would how would this uh, affect my life. And at the time, I was uh, busy writing and acting and all that stuff, and I thought, and a few funny experiences happened. Like I told my dad about the, the cancer, and he said, well, uh, how many testicles do you have right now? Like he just the math was overwhelming. And then my mom kind of made it a lot about her. And uh, these were both great characters, I thought, and great situations that I can turn into comedy. And so I, I rushed to uh, shoot this web series before my hair fell out. So so that gave me um, and, and, you know, turning a little to Carrie Fisher, she would always say, take your broken heart and go make art. And so in some ways, the cancer diagnosis, that's what I did. I turned to making some art out of it and uh, that helped me the first time around and inspired other people by the way oh i hope so oh well, yeah i had a friend uh, my friend tim mckernan he um he said to me you know i have a lump on my testicle too and i was like go to the doctor and so like don't wait a day he did everything the same as me but just like a week later and um so i like to say i saved his life uh, and you, you might know. very uh <laughs> sure well have and, that and, was a- and for anyone listening too it's it's important to know that testicular cancer is a young man's Cancer. That's and so, very important to know. And so, like, I checked just, myself right away. Yeah, yeah, just just because you're in your 20s doesn't, you know, I think, oh, this won't affect me. You know, like, but be was, aware, be aware of those lumps. Yeah. So I'm. Let's I'm, all check right now. Yeah, I'm about. Uh, I'm just for fans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm about to turn 43. Um, it came back um, last year, and so what was I? I was in my late 30s. So it really, it really can vary. You know, the ages. So just uh, be aware of your body and know what's going on. Now, as a gay man, we all have body issues to begin with. And then, like you said, to have, you know, losing your hair, dealing with your testicles. How did you how did you deal with that? And also, like, how did you just get the strength to, to go through? Did you have like a mantra? Was there something you subscribed to or you were just you were just made that way? Well, I was big on therapy in 2015 and the, the humor and all of it uh, helped then. It was a little different in 2020 recently when when the cancer came back and I had to, I didn't have to do chemo in 2015. But I had to do it in 2020. And uh, for that, I had been through so much therapy and so much self-help stuff that I, I did feel more centered and more optimistic. You didn't get angry? I got sad a couple times. Mm. So the night before I shaved my head when my hair was coming out in clumps, um, that was really hard on me. And uh, I couldn't sleep. Steve was already in bed. And so I was just kind of by myself in the living room. It was dark and um, quiet and I remember crying and saying over and over um, I don't want this I don't want this 
But I, I know from my self-help stuff that that's war with reality and uh, no one wins with that. So the opposite of war with reality is loving what is and, and having some degree of faith that uh, reality will be kind in the long run. And then I did start having lovely experiences. So uh, one day I was at chemo and there was, there was an old lady across from me and she, she would spend the whole time knitting. I was on my phone and she would knit. And she came up to me and she goes, uh, hey, do you like color? And I was like, oh, God, what is happening? <laughs> She's going to read your aura. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to look at my Instagram, ma'am. And, uh, and I was like, sure. And so she pulls out of her bag a rainbow um, knit cap that she had knitted for me. I think we have a picture of, we, of, yep, of I, it. Yep, I have a picture of that that I took in the bathroom, which, by the way, at the Cancer Center had great lighting. Look at that lighting, guys. I mean, I'm sorry. That, that, lighting, that lighting, I was like, what set is that? But yeah, it's like, no. thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so she, she made me this cap, and she also thought I was 19, so I will never forget her. <laughs> um, but little moments like that, it's like, it's, it's hard for me to say that the experience was... Uh, terrible because um, I can look and say, oh, there were there were some rays of sh sunshine in there. But let's talk about the reality. Uh, you know, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. She's she's still on her cancer journey. And it's been rough because friends, even your best friends, you know, we put them in my mom and I jokingly put them in categories. There's the friends that are so uncomfortable that they just disappear. Mm -hmm. There's the friend that will send you an encouraging message on Facebook. And you're like, well, that's nice. But, you know, really doesn't help me much. Yeah. Um, there's the friends that say everything wrong, like trust in God. It's like, well, OK, if I trusted him and he still did this, like right. you did something wrong. Um, and as somebody's husband, as somebody's partner, you know, we've, we've seen how cancer can tear families apart and relations apart because somebody's partner just can't be there the way uh, that they need them to be. Because cancer is so many from from the medical ickiness to the mood swings to the to the physical changes. It, some people just cannot handle that. So, Stephen, I don't, if, if you don't mind to share a little bit of when you found out Byron's diagnosis um, and how does a couple get through this? Well, I slept through it, apparently, while he was I weeping was, in the living I room. Know, <laughs> he's having a dramatic right. moment. Right. He's having like, a terms of asleep. endearment moment. He's like, wake up, yeah. bitch. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I will say it really brought us closer together in part, too, because this was happening just you got your diagnosis like, like two weeks after the beginning of the pandemic. And so yeah. we were sheltering at home already. So it was really scary for me because I took on a lot of like, oh, I have to keep him safe. I'm the only one who can go out in this new world mm. where we don't know the rules and we're wearing masks and yeah, I could bring germs back home. Yeah. And he's uh, compromised from the from the chemo. So I took a lot of that on. Um, but it helped with some of what you're saying with the friend, you know, like we had to keep everyone at bay, you know, like we couldn't have people drop by. We couldn't have people, say, you know, so it's sort of like the world disappeared and we um, we were able to just focus on each other, I think. And, it, you know, it was the start of a very meaningful year for the two of us, um, you know, which led to us then getting engaged and. And married and, all, you know, all sorts of exciting things. We're also really, I think, one of our strengths is communication. So I was very clear about what I needed. You were very responsive with all that stuff. And uh, and I should also add that testicular cancer is uh, not, not the worst kind of cancer. So I didn't have, like, a debilitating thing. I had a treatable. And it sucked. The chemo sucked. Um, nausea and all that stuff it was all it was all gross but it, it wasn't you know some people have it much worse and i can i can yeah. see how it's it's harder to yeah i lost my hair at 25 and i had no sympathy for that and you were like but you like, know what it still it like, goddamn yeah, good, you still look so great this, i'm gonna be a great. hot thank you i feel like i've learned to work this look but i'm like bitches you know creeping in on my look you know i was yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah but it's funny in the reaction of you know everybody when I would tell my mom or when other people talk about cancer, we should be able to talk about it without getting uncomfortable. Um, but it's everybody's first question. What kind of cancer? Like there's an OK cancer. Yeah. You know, any type of cancer can can kill you. But but then you say, you know, it's this type of cancer. And I'm like, oh, it's like, well, that's not a good reaction either. Right. You know, it's just we're still uncomfortable talking about it and how to respond to it. Um, you know, it really gets you thinking about life after death and you know we talk about grieving in in uh lily um and there's grieving in a star is born especially when you know the the kind of history um so how have have has it changed for you dealing with grief going through this kind of process well we is it fair to talk about tilda sure um we lost our uh our sweet little terrier tilda um recently and I that didn't was know that. yeah she she um 
she was about the the vet thing she was like 17 and she had been in a steady decline and uh, we were able to give her 24-hour care, literally waking up in the middle of the night to, to take her out or whatever she needed because of the pandemic. Um, and uh, anyway, whatever. But that was uh, that was our first, I think, experience as a couple of dealing with uh, that with some grief together. And I'm really proud of us. Yeah. Yeah, I am too. I will say like one of our strength, too. And I want to stress it because this is getting very heavy. But these books are very hopefully funny. <laughs> also, and and humor for us has yeah. been such a yeah. um, such a tool for us to get through um, everything we've been through. Humor is is the biggest tool. My mom taught me that as a little kid. That's where I get my sense of humor. Uh, you know, we had rough times. You know, when I was a kid, and it literally can get you through everything. And yes, yep. I do have to point out um, each one of the books is laced with that, which makes you comfortable enough to have these heavy talks. Yeah. Um, the humor really, you know, it's like a spoonful of sugar, you yeah. know, um, especially in Gunkel, every one of his like sassy sayings and references and just the humor with the kids and those kids, you know, are adults in terms of how they dealt with life. And it's like, you know, I, I associate myself more with the kids in the book, which is very funny because, mm. oh, you know, there's this kind of like naivety or naivety about life and how they have to come to terms with stuff, but still having the joy of a kid, which we should all mm. have. But humor definitely is. Yeah. And these are the stories that I grew up loving, by the way. You know, like I think back to the movie Terms of Endearment, which I watched with my mom, you know, when I was, you know, 10, 11 years old or something. And we remember it as this movie where Deborah Winger says goodbye to her kids. But it's so funny. I just made Byron watch it recently because when I discovered he hadn't seen it but it is one of the funniest films especially when she's shouting at the nurses yeah. you know it's yeah. like I give my daughter the shot yes yes, yes. yes. Uh, all right <laughs> we're gonna lighten things up we're yeah. gonna take a break when we come back we're gonna play a little truth or sip and then we're also gonna talk more about the books we're gonna talk about carrie fisher and we're gonna talk about tilda swinton tilda swinton oh, yes we are when we come back all right and we are back okay we're gonna play a little uh truth or sip Sean, take it away, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pour myself a little bit. Truth or sip on On the Rocks with Alexander. This sounds serious. All right, here's all right, here's where the truth comes out. Okay. So um, you either have to tell us the truth, okay, or you have to take a sip. And Byron, you're you're not drinking, so um, it's truth or sing. Oh, great. So you have, you have to sing a line from whatever if, if, if you don't want to answer. Okay. <clears throat> All right, this is for both of you. What character from your book or books is essential to the story but you don't really like? You're like, uh, okay, they're in the book. Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think in the Gunkel, it's the sister, Clara. And she actually has legitimate points. She has a, she has a legitimate point of view, but she um, could loosen up. I do like the scene uh, where she's been at the hotel the whole time and she's just exhausted. And of course, you know, she has a drink and she's like, you know, at first she's like, no. And then she has it. That to me. And we've all had people like that in our in, in our families. Yeah. But it's I wouldn't want to hang out with her. <laughs> I would say Bruce, uh, the executive assistant who connects <laughs> assistant Charlie with celebrity Kathy. He's uh, he's a bit uptight, a bit insecure and not very self-aware. And I would say uh, I don't I don't love him. And you know he's going to be in that position the rest of his life. That's that's yep. all he's going to do. Always chasing. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Always, chasing. Always chasing. Oh, I just took a sip anyway. I know. That's I fine. Want to, okay. Too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What is the? This is for both of you. What is the biggest pet peeve you have about the other one that you've never told each other? Zip. Really? Just, no, I'm just I want to know. <laughs> I, I tell Steve question. all my pet peeves with him. Like, yeah. sometimes his gum chewing is a little oh, loud yeah. for me. I hate loud chewers, mouth breathers. Oh, my God. And then um, I'm a terrible passenger in the car. So anytime he takes his eyes off the road, I feel like we are swerving off a cliff. <laughs> and I'm always like, are you okay? Are you, you know? So those are those are a couple. Those do, Are there others that you recall me talking about? Uh, about me? Uh-huh. Uh, no, I, I think... I want to make sure we get all of them out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is therapy. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. What about me? What What are What are your pet peeves about me? Um, I'm pretty great. Uh, you are pretty great. Is there yeah. one that you haven't really addressed? <laughs> um, I, uh, you, 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 uh, I'm not a morning person. 
and you come at me with a lot of energy in the morning because you've been oh. up before. I I'm so, so excited to is, see it. And all these yeah. things are like on your mind. Yeah. I'm like, what do we do about this? And blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah. I'm with you. I'm like, yeah. bitch, let me, like, let's watch an episode and or something. Yeah, before yeah, you come yeah. At before me. We, yeah, I have to have the cup of coffee before we talk, yeah. really. But yeah. you like to say hi to me in the morning. And like, oh, you will say hi like 15 too. times. I was like, one will one will do. Well, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't left the house and come back. You don't need to say hi. Oh, my God. It's true. Again. Yeah. Byron, a memory about Carrie Fisher that you haven't really shared before. Um, she was she, just how generous she was. I think um, there was one time um, an acquaintance of hers was having trouble with his teenage daughters, and uh, he was telling Carrie about it, and she was like, "Well, everyone, come on over." And so this guy and his two teenage daughters came over to her house, went into her bedroom, they all climbed in bed, and she uh, did like a counseling session. She was just so generous like that and and wise so she she always had great advice i love that and we're going to talk about a whole thing about carrie fisher okay um steven worst fan meeting at a book signing <laughs> <laughs> i you know i haven't really had a bad one people are truly wonderful and i miss doing book events in person i hope to be able to get through it soon but for lily and the octopus in particular you know everyone would come up to me and tell me about their dead dog that's or I would sad. have to I would have to sign uh, <laughs> books. To, you know, can you can you sign books to my five dearly departed dogs? Uh, Tiddlywinks, Mister Bojangles, <laughs> Skimmity Doo, and I'm like, how do you spell Skimmity Doo? You know, like. Uh, so sometimes I will say that was a, a, a lot. You know, like I would have to take a clonopin or something before. Yeah, especially <laughs> when they unload your grief and then it's like you have to saturate. Yeah, it and, no, I yeah. do. Re- oh, here's what I do remember: some woman, and I apologies if you're listening because it. it I am truly moved that you were moved by something that I wrote, but came up to me and just burst into tears and, you know, and then looked at me like, why, why am I not crying too? And I'm like, lady, I'm cried out, you know, like I, you know, I wrote this book to heal and it, it kind of worked and I've processed my grief, but she was working through something. So it was very raw for her. And meeting fans can be very, very interesting because people are just interesting but they feel that they know you because they've read your book and they feel this intimate connection Mm -hmm. and so they assume that you're on that same level with them and you just can't be there for everybody but there's a lot of strange people (laughs) byron worst celebrity meeting ever oh my gosh that is such a hard one um babe do you know that i've talked about weird celebrity meetings or I I've, I really feel like I've had uh, some pretty good experiences, to be honest. Um, of course, as soon as, as soon as we move on, I'm going to remember. Yeah. But I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, I, I remember C- Carrie asked us once at a party to check and see if if Kathy Bates was stealing the silver. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> That's and true. I want to be very clear: we love Kathy Bates, and she was absolutely not stealing the silver. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it was funny to yeah. me yeah. that that Carrie thought it might be a possibility that yeah. she was running off with the family silver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And would Carrie say a lot of things just to cause havoc and like to play with you and just cause havoc? Oh, in with, your that, own with everyone. Yeah, mind. she she did not want a boring vanilla moment. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what people loved about her is the neon lights all the time. All right. So this is for each other. You have to answer about the uh, other. Who's the biggest diva of the two? <gasps> I think you. Yeah, probably. Aww. Oh, first one to start a fight. Ooh, that's hard because we're uh, we're really good with that stuff. I would probably say me, only because I feel like I'm a little bit more needy. So I'll be like, uh, oh, how how much longer do you want to keep your mail piled here? <laughs> right, dude. Yeah, passive well, aggressive. passive. You start to yeah, pass the the passive aggressive. That's you. But I could say it's me because I think sometimes I'm a little more careless with your feelings and. I should be. Oh, that's very sweet. Who's the worst driver? Oh, well, I, he's gonna say me, but say it's him. just because I drive all the time. He drives all the time. Now, yeah. if Carrie Fisher were answering this question, who would she say? Oh, well, she didn't think I was a great driver. Uh, she <laughs> was always go. like, "Why are you? Do not stop at a yellow light. Go." It was that kind of thing. If you stop at one more yellow light, you're fired. That was yeah. a direct quote. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to keep you safe. You're an international icon. Yeah. I got my license at the Carrie Fisher School for Driving. So. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the more frugal? Oh. That's a good question. Um, I think we're both frugal on different things. So, like, uh, I'll spend money on, like, a few, uh, like, a bunch of things. Maybe I'll spend $100 on a bunch of shirts at Goodwill or something. I love, like, recycled clothes. And Whereas Steve will spend $100 on, like, uh, this One is nice a, thing. a yeah. classic stamp. Stamp. That's not true. That came to mind. <laughs> like you bought that thing. You bought that thing for your brother, and now it's like 
cluttered in the in your office you know that that thing oh yeah, yeah anyway yeah. that comes to mind yeah i did that to support the post office they were going out of business sweet. last yeah. year and i was afraid we would <laughs> lose the election oh it's it very sweet just, i don't have a thing for stamps it's very sweet I'm, although i miss licking them i know if you were to write the biography of the other what would the title be mm. oh my goodness i don't know i'm not great with this guy with the titles uh, a star is bored Tilda Swinton answers an ad on Craigslist. Last Will and Testicle. Like, you are killer was, with the that title. That one was pretty Thank My you. books Thank are you. all the editor, the gunkle. You know, I feel like I'm terrible with titles. I'm going to throw one out just because it came to mind uh, uh, based on your story about the me greeting you in the mornings. But maybe I would call it Good Morning, Handsome. Oh. Mm. Isn't that sweet? Wait, that's that's, sweet. that's your book about me? Yeah. And what uh, would your book about me be? Uh, you, you have a... Th- uh, you always say this, and I, I picked it up from you, but I, I just love the spirit of it so much. It's just called More, More, More. Oh. Because I think people would read this book and want more of you. More, more, more is something I say to kind of like get off the phone. Good to talk to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. More, more, more. Click. <laughs> so that's kind of a. Well, but I like the, this but be- the, it's more, 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 but not now. <laughs> But I, I'd like more, <laughs> leave more that part out. because yeah, right, more, right. more could change. It could mean something good, like more, 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 right? Or like more, 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 like you need more, more, yeah. more. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, do you know each other's celebrity hall pass? Like, do you know that if the celebrity walk in the room, they could go off for ten minutes and be like, "Oh, I expected that." Oh, yeah, well, I, yeah, Byron, you have several, I think. Um, Max Greenfield is oh, that yeah. one? Yeah, he's one. Yeah, from the New Girl. Okay. Max Greenfield. New Girl. Um, yeah. Who's that guy? Um, the X Men guy. Oh wait. Don't say like Hugh Jackman. No no no, 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 no. James no. Marsden. No, this is a great one. Hold on. He plays the McAvoy. Flash. Oh. Oh, Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller is one of yours too. Yeah, Ezra oh. Miller and yeah. James McAvoy, both yeah. of them. Yeah. James McAvoy is like vanilla ice cream. It's like. Meh. Is he? But Ezra Miller, are you kidding? Oh, I know he's so oh. beautiful. Yeah. Oh mm. my God, and Steve's. Oh, you like the guy um, who quit the good. Wife? Oh, Josh Charles. Josh yeah. Charles is one of yours, right? Yeah. Who else? In case they're listening. Yeah. I mean, let's, oh, yeah. I write this hall pass right now. Um, yeah, this is a good question. I have to. The scary thing about hall passes in L.A. is it's like you could very actually, possible. It could very, very, very yeah. well happen. Yeah. But in L.A. also, then you just make it a threesome. It's like it doesn't have to be like. You, know, <laughs> you don't have to make it a big That's deal. Yeah. I literally, I mean, hello, a throuple in, you in can, the, the gunkle. <laughs> yeah, you can have Ezra Miller as long as I can at least be in the room. Oh, so yeah. see, that's love. That yeah. is love. Yeah. You, he'd probably give you pointers, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Ezra and I are open to your suggestions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that was our uh, truth or sip. Oh, yeah. I did not sip nearly enough, so I'll We're do it now. We're kind yeah. of truth guys, so yeah. kind of, I don't know. All right. So we have to talk about Carrie Fisher. Um, my my uh, audience knows that I'm just a huge classic Hollywood fan, and Carrie Fisher is a product of classic Hollywood. Um, knowing the history uh, of your life um, and seeing some of the beautiful pictures that you've shared of, of you and Carrie, and we, we have a few of them as well. Um, and then to write this homage to that time together, A Star is Bored, um, inspired by your time with her, but reading it, you just can't help uh, and put it together. And I have to tell you, I told everybody, read this book, and they're like, well, what's it about? And it's like, in a nutshell, it was inspired by you being Carrie Fisher's assistant. It's about that kind of relationship. And so somebody said, oh, great, another person writing a tell-all about somebody that they work for. And I'm like, no, you don't understand it. This is, this is a love story. I think in the article that I did with you, that's what I called it. It's a true Hollywood love story. Mm-hmm. It's such a beautiful homage and sharing some of the bumps as well. But back to Carrie Fisher. Mm. You know, everybody calls her Princess Leia. And yes, I mean, she made history uh, by, by playing Princess Leia. And of course, her, her comeback with, with the later films, that got the most reaction. Harrison Ford showed up and people were like, oh, yay. And then then we see Carrie Fisher on the screen and this, this eruption. Um, you know, she touched people's hearts in such different ways from being open with her own struggles in her own life inspired many people but her on-screen performances but she has this whole history as well as other acting roles and her writing you know so it's very easy to catalog her as princess leia um and she's got this huge huge resume and and library of work um i i want to know from being here in the same room the first time you met her can you kind of walk us through that and like the first few moments like knowing that you're going to see Carrie Fisher. Yep. So I was a Star Wars fan, but I wasn't a crazy fan. So um, I went and also, uh, you know, I had a journalism background. So I was kind of serious 
and I was depressed and I, you know, so I was stiff and all that stuff. And, um, I remember the gates opening, um, driving up her driveway and it was Christmas lights on every tree. This was, this was like in July or something. <laughs> and, uh, uh, her house was full of like, uh, beautiful things everywhere, quirky things everywhere. Every rafter had some little piece of art hanging from it. And uh, so I go inside and uh, a housekeeper uh, invites me to sit down and uh, I'm looking out into the backyard through, she's lived in this really old house and the glass was even old, like that kind of wobbly kind yep. of. A, oh. And uh, I this see This excites her. me so much, by the way. Like, I, can, <laughs> I can feel this and yep. smell it and, and see it. Yep, so I'm sitting there, I'm waiting for this moment. There's like this, uh, above me is like, she had this netting that had like little crystals sewn in so that the sun would come in and put little rainbows all over the room. And anyway, in the backyard through this wobbly glass, I see her run by um, holding paper and papers are flying. It is like a, <laughs> it's like a, a comedy. And um, it was her book. It was, uh, I think it was Shockaholic and she was trying to fax it and she couldn't figure out the fax machine. Oh. I know. And she couldn't figure out the scan, uh, scanning and emailing and the neighbor who was a perfumist was over trying to help <laughs> figure it all out. And I remember having a moment where I was like, I think that this household needs me. <laughs> Uh, you know, and um, anyway, then she came in, she sat down and was truly, truly lovely and generous. And um, my big moment with her was uh, everyone was like, don't don't bring up Star Wars. Don't yeah. say you're don't you know. And so but I, I couldn't resist this one thing. And I said to her, listen, I have to tell you in case I never see you again, if I don't get the job, I loved you, loved you in Drop Dead Fred. <laughs> and she says, uh, was I in A that? Classic. <laughs> yeah, and then, yes, you were the friend, and you you know the whole thing. And anyway, I think she was just kidding, but um, but that was my that was my moment. Easy, chill, quick to comedy, um, and uh, and I was like, this this is uh, this feels like a place I belong. Now we know Carrie met and you know had friendships with a bunch of people, um, you know, and like with assistants. From what I've heard is that she would just kind of go through them. What do you think it was about you? Uh, that you two bonded because it became this friendship and it became this love relationship that you had for each other and, and respect. What do you think it was about you that she responded so well to? I, I really don't know. All I can say is uh, I think we were both um, drawn to each other because we were both isolated. I was isolated by depression. She was isolated by her fame. Um, and then we have these two people who can be honest with each other. And I think the honesty just breeds more honesty and more truth and I think that I think that all respect kind of comes from that well and that's what you were saying what works with with you two is that honesty and communication yeah yeah so I, I really think that that's that was sort of it I, I also didn't play um, a lot of these uh, assistant games you know I I didn't have training as an assistant I had training in communications and uh, so I didn't go in there thinking that I would be some enabler. Um, I went in there thinking I would have good boundaries and that I would be a healthy resource for someone who was very public about uh, needing that. What's the biggest thing that Carrie taught you about life? I learned from her that um, life tends to work out, things tend to work out, and I was someone who would be so worried about the flight. Uh, we got to get there on time. We're late. Are all the bags packed? Do you have, do, are all of your toiletries in separate Ziploc, Ziploc bags? Like what's the, you know, and, uh, and she would just be like, it's fine. If, if I need shampoo in, in, um, Vancouver, Canada, we can go find shampoo. You know, it was so, so I learned that I can stress about it and it'll work out or I can skip the stressful part and try to just trust that it'll all work out. And, uh, I think that was a big take, take away. Yeah. There's always another flight. That was, there's always another yeah. flight. But by the way, we did not miss flights. Oh, okay. We did well, not miss flights. Thanks to you. Yeah. Thanks to you. <laughs> One of our biggest travel disasters was I uh, we we arrived home from somewhere. We were both exhausted, couldn't wait to get home, and I had to go home twice. I had to bring her home, unpack her, and then go to my own house and unpack Forget myself. It. Yeah. So Forget we're it. we arrive there, I see her name on a on a card from the limo driver and we're like, hi, 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 yeah, come on. And we get in the car, we're driving along, and uh, this guy's like radio goes off and the dispatcher is like, Hey, uh, where are you? He's like, Oh, I'm I'm on my way. I've got the client. And they're like, No, 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 they're at the airport waiting. He's like, I'm sorry, what's your name? We got I put her in the wrong limo. <gasps> I'm with her in the wrong limo. And so we both just sank. 
and he's panicking because he doesn't want to get fired. And she's, you know, rich and famous celebrity. So she's like, just take us. Just take us. That's and what I would say. And let, like, It'll work yeah, itself. And they can have our limo. Have, <laughs> have, give them our limo. And I'm just like, oh, I wish she knew that that just is not how the world works. And anyway, sadly, we had to go back and all that. But that was oh, that's that's a, a very embarrassing travel mess that I got us into. Well, and you know, traveling with anybody, even your best friend, even your husband, can be so trying mm-hmm. because travel, yes, you have those great moments while traveling, but traveling is just not fun. And yeah. Unpacking, uh, forget it. Yeah. All right, so this is for the classic Hollywood Alexander growing up on watching old movies over and over again, seeing Debbie Reynolds on stage when she did Unsinkable Molly Brown at the El Cajon Theater, and it was one of her last stage kind of stuff, and then, you know, she stuck to movies. Um, you got to meet Debbie Reynolds. The gay boy in me, the TMC lover in me, I just have to know uh, what she was like in real life. So I, I tried to capture her spirit in A Star is Bored in the character of Miss Gracie, um, who's, who was inspired by uh, Miss Debbie. And so Debbie Reynolds was not an actress. She was a movie star. Yeah, and that's a big difference. A big difference. Yeah. And to be in her presence, I was always scared of her, even though she was delightful. I mean, she could be firm, but she was delightful. But I always like, I always had to have a jacket on, make sure my hair looks. She good. probably respected that because that was what Hollywood. Oh my god, did. it's like walking to the Oval Office. You have to have your jacket on and a tie on yes. to walk into the Oval Office. She like, liked, that was it for Miss Debbie. Yep. So she was she was old school like that, but uh, but truly truly delightful and um, and just like you would see, just like she appeared on talk shows and talking to Oprah, it was the same. She was the same in public and private, and Carrie was like that too. Um, and you know the deer and the hand, you know, all of that stuff was uh, just very organic. That was just her, and um, truly, a, truly a lovely human being. Loved Carrie, loved her family so much. Now you went through some grief when when Carrie Fisher uh, passed away. That must have been hard for you because, uh, no pun intended, but that was a huge chapter of your life, and you know, you kind of left from that experience having grown and learned about life in Hollywood to become your own presence right. in, in Hollywood, so to speak. Yeah, I had left the job for a couple of years, so I wasn't uh, her employee at that time. Uh, we were just friends, and we, we would text all the time. I saw her at her birthday party. Um, Steve and I went to a birthday party um, in October, I think, um, before she died in December. And uh, she was the first significant loss in my life. Mm. So my parents are both still alive. My sister's alive. My grandparents, they died, but I was very young. And uh, so that was my first experience with that kind of grief. And it was uh, it was a big loss and a loss that I know that I share with the whole world. Stephen, what was it like stepping into this kind of world? Uh, It was very interesting, but she loved Byron and that was very obvious. Um, Certainly from the first time I was invited to the house, you know, someone could have been like, oh, sure, have him come over and that would be that. But she greeted me at the front door. Do you remember this? That like she mm-hmm. came out and be sh- was sure to welcome me and welcome me into the home. And that was a reflection, I think, of the respect that she had for Byron. And she was she was truly lovely. And um, you know, it, it, you know, I was probably more of a crazy Star Wars fan. Um, so you know, to me, I'm like, oh goodness, you know, like I'm in Princess Leia's house. Like it, it was, it was a lot of fun. But also, her writing was also something that was so important to writing me. You know, like so postcards funny. from the edge. That that type of taking life and and putting it and, and blending it with art. You know, it's something that Byron and I both do to this day. And she was the master of that. And 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 also, by the way, walking that line between humor and honest heartbreak. You know. That's a hard thing to do, you know, coming in that from the gunkel, like if you, if you go one joke too many or or are serious too long without a moment of levity, she just had effortlessly was able to sort of walk that tightrope and um, she was she, there'll never be another Carrie Fisher. No. And that's uh, what I did love about the gunkel. Um, it didn't dwell in the grief, but it, it was there. But in, in a, such a special way, uh, when one of the characters, when the main character uh, gives a gift of a picture of somebody that has passed, in this whole festive kind of moment, while they're sharing like an anti mame type uh-huh. of uh, moment, it, it was it was very touching. Um, you know, it's stuff we should all incorporate in our lives. You know, we shouldn't just try to be one way, especially now with social media, we're all smoke and mirrors, happy, happy, happy. We should be sharing these kind of stories and, and making it uh, kind of real. Now, Byron, you're writing before A Star is Bored, you know, uh, you know playwriting and, and writing uh, web series and, and uh, your journalist. 
was it kind of naked in a way to put out a novel um, and when oh my god here I'm throwing it away um, <laughs> like when the box comes with your first print I have never experienced that and for both of you that must be an amazing feeling um, when the box is there and it's like this is the book that you've been working on yeah um, tell me about that kind of naked feeling of different writing and what people expected from you and the first week it was out you're like okay how's it gonna go uh, yeah well it's very yeah it's very scary and uh it was heightened for me because i was um finishing up chemo yeah. and uh and looking forward to the book launch so uh as a as a big happy moment and i was worried oh i i hope it is i hope it's well received um uh, based on all this uh, hope i'm i'm putting on it and i so it was a real relief it was a real relief when people recognized it as a loving story um, and uh, that brought me great comfort and, and still brings me great joy. Yeah, but there was a little added uh, stress up for the actual unboxing oh, of yes. the book. Well, so the actual unboxing, I proposed to Steve in the acknowledgments. Oh, oh, God, I was going to say, yeah. yes. Yeah, so I, uh, and he didn't know that. He had he had read uh, early drafts of the book. I, and th all This of is a movie scene, right? Yeah. And I thought, you know what? I have, uh, you know, people don't publish a book every day. I'm going to use this opportunity to, to make a, take a, you know, a big, have a big moment. Now, you have an advanced reader edition. Is it in there? No, no, I, yeah, because no. so, I read the advanced reader yeah. edition, so and it, it was, was not in there. it was before. Oh, interesting. The hardcover, and yes. uh, I reached out to my editor. It was, and I said, "Hey, I want to add a few words to the acknowledgments." And he said, uh, "What words? It's it's at the printer." And I said, "Will you marry me? I want to ask Steve, you know." And he was like, "Oh, of course, of course." And he sent some emails and worked it out. And so he's like, "I'm shipping it to you right away." And so as soon as it was printed, they shipped it over and. Um, I said, Steve, you know, will you read this? I, I have a, I changed up the acknowledgments, the part with you. And so I handed it to him and he read it. And he was basically like, wait, is this is this in every copy of the book? <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, it's going to be in the Library of Congress. This is real. Anyway, he, he said yes. It was very lovely. Yeah. And for, for anyone who's following this little love story there, my response to the proposal is in the Do you acknowledgments. Do uh, reading it? To the go oh. Goodness. All right. Put a, this whole Byron paragraph. All right. Finally, <laughs> I have to take off my. Hold on. Because, you know, the Eye Doctor wanted me to get transition, or not trans, but, but progressive lenses. And I would. Um, oh, there was a little snipey uh, quote by Patrick in the book. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, that came like, right from me. <laughs> I feel you, girl. All right. <laughs> Finally, to Byron Lane, a thousand times yes. In the acknowledgments for his novel, A Star is Bored, Byron proposed. In case anyone had read his book, you should. Then, and then was waiting for my next book to see what my answer was, now you know. At the very least, I wanted my acceptance documented in the Library of Congress alongside the contents of Abe Lincoln's pockets and a lock of Walt Whitman's hair. I'm so damn lucky to spend my life with you. Oh, thanks, babe. On sale now. Yay! <laughs> yes. Um, and, and please get it. Um, so the Gunko deals uh, with a very confident gay man who's kind of lived a little solitude in his whole life, um, it doesn't turn upside down. It just becomes more colorful, I, I think. Uh, what I love is that he retains who he is, and it just grows on that. Um, but he does come into possession of children in the household. Uh, um, not to put you both on the spot, but have you had the, the kid talk? <laughs> well, I mean, only... <laughs> or should we have it now in front oh, yeah, of let, let's millions have of people? Because I think only... <laughs> we have to find a way to top our next acknowledgments. And then I know, we can do. I don't know. The only <laughs> thing is, you know, like kids, but I don't know that I necessarily... You know, like Patrick in the Gunko, I don't know at the outset I necessarily think I want them, but, uh, you know... I, I get tired. I don't do anything. I get tired. I don't know. I think the, well, I think the window is closed. Nieces so. and, and, and nephews. Yeah, but they're on the East Coast. They're on the other side of the country. So that's the right that's the right amount. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. If Steve said to me it was really important to him, I would uh, go for it. But I think at this point we're we're really happy. And uh, you know, when we had our little dog Tilda, it it did feel like uh, Tilda made us kind of a a family in a special way. And I think we're both excited to fill the house with. Uh, little fur babies so this is very interesting you know we're dealing with my my mom's dog sickness and uh you know you had lily um so my thought is uh, is you know you you have this amazing dog i'm not sure that i could get connected to another dog knowing that that kind of loss would be there well i think a, a couple things one is i i definitely had that feeling after after lily passed and you know i've had dogs throughout my life but i do think you know if you've had animals um you, you know multiple animals over the years there's one or two maybe in a lifetime that you have a special soul connection oh, interesting. to. interesting 
And um, for me, that was Lily. And so I was very worried. I was like, what if the dog isn't enough like Lily? You know, will I have a hard time attaching to this dog? Or what if the dog's too much like Lily? And I was worried about uh, being resentful that that dog was trying to, to take her place. But, you know, dogs are, they're all different and they work their way into your heart in their own way. And I, I'm sure it's like like kids, you know, like you, you mentioned Auntie Mame as a, as a model for, for Patrick and, and, Yes, she 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 dealt with her ward in a certain way, which was kind of shipping him off to, to boarding school. Patrick rises to the challenge, I think, a little bit more than Mame did. But it was interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned Stan Zimmerman earlier. It was sort of interesting to think about. You know, Patrick Dennis, who wrote the novel Mame in 1955. You know, he was at least bisexual. He was married to a woman and had kids, but he was he was a closeted bisexual at the time. Um, you know, and and not being able to be out as a writer. I think of you know Tennessee Williams and some of these other mid-century writers who who sort of wrote these fabulous women as kind of stand-ins for for gay men and certainly a lot of people look back at the golden girls that way too um you know, with the amount of you know queer talent that was in that writer's room as well so it was, it was a really fun um fun way to sort of reclaim a character in that way and and write openly about and, and making them making them gay in a way that you couldn't have done you know 75 years ago certainly when when that novel first was published but Seeing uh, seeing gay people sort of rise to the challenge of children, I'm very inspired by by the many g wonderful, beautiful LGBTQ plus families with children now. Um, I'm so admirous of it. And we have friends who have who have kids, and and watching them parent is remarkable. Um, I don't know. I I don't know. All right. Well, if you both can indulge me, we're going to do a little hot topic for social okay. media. Yay. All right. Sean, take it away. It's time for Hot Topics on On the Rocks with Alexander. Better pour yourself another. This is hot. That's hot. That's hot. This is really hot. That's hot. That's hot. So hot, you guys. Okay, we're going to end the show with this uh, this hot topic. Um, I'm glad I have two authors for this one. Uh, required reading in schools has been changing. I just found out recently the Diary of Anne Frank is no longer required reading. People have said The Great Gatsby is not something our kids should be reading because it's about some rich white guy with rich white guy problems and doesn't reflect our current American culture. We know Tom Sawyer has been labeled as racist. It has its problems. Here's the hot topic. Should we be getting rid of the classics and attempt to become more progressive and reflective of our current culture, or are we sacrificing a study in classic writing and themes to keep up with political correctness? Hmm. Do you want me to jump in? Well, this is, this I'll is start by saying I, I heard a story recently of a man who uh, the books that he didn't want his kids to read, he put on a shelf labeled do not read. Uh, and of course, that's the, those that's are the, the books, first thing that they would reach that's for. The, those are the books they went to. So sometimes these kind of um, efforts uh, backfire in a way. Um, but it, it is kind of a, a fine line, isn't it, of... Um, classic knowledge and uh, reading about classic uh, classic works of literature and uh, but doing so in context yeah I I would continue to teach the classics I would maybe think of a curriculum where you pair them with a more modern work and then you can facilitate a discussion about what has changed for the better and and how sometimes too you know I, byron's heard me say this rant but i was thinking of it in in relation to the they just said the, the friends reunion you know and that show is almost 30 years old since it first premiered but friends was not great on queer issues and there was a lot of think pieces about you know friends friends is bad on 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 queer issues well dated thing feels dated is not a thesis in and of itself um where i think Instead of being angry at something that was imperfect on queer issues as, as in relation to how we view them today, be grateful for all the people who did the hard work mm. to change the culture so rapidly that something from a quarter century ago, which is not that long, you know, long ago, and it's still, we're watching it in reruns, right? that something from, from 25 years ago feels that dated and feels that wrong on the issues. It's not magically that it feels wrong it's because we've done the work to make the culture better and so i would like to pair something classic with something modern and then talk about 
how how the culture has evolved and why the dated thing feels dated. I really love that because it's like a foil, you know, it's like, you know, a, a reflection of each other. Um, and, you know, back in, in the sitcom days of Friends, you know, it's like, that's so gay. And there was like jokes about Joey and Chandler, you know, oh, God, they're so gay. And it's like, well, that's not the worst thing, you know. Yeah. Um, I love this idea. Hmm. Good. Good job, babe. All right. Well, we did it. We did it. <laughs> All right. So that, that was our hot topic. Just bam. Well done. Oh, now do you have another? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> no, girl, I have many, many hot topics. Uh, but I wanted. Well, I wanted... wait, who banned Anne Frank? Uh, they, they didn't ban it. It's just not re required. It's a required reading. reading. Well, see, that's another thing. thing. So sometimes we think like history is longer ago than it was. Anne Frank was born the same year as Barbara Walters. And and so I saw that fact uh, probably a month ago and it yeah, just blew my mind. It, isn't that truly incredible? So the fact that you know it doesn't feel so historical when we think she could still be here today. And when we're talking about the atrocities that have happened in this last year in our own nation, you know we think, oh, you know something like the Holocaust just becomes this farther away idea, and it's like, you know, we're not, you know, we're not in it, but this is how this kind of situation happened. Um, and so that kind of scares me, uh, talking about Stan Zimmerman again. He produced a play of Dyer Van Frank, mm -hmm. and the young actress who he finally cast, her audition, you know, he always asks, you know, what's your relationship with um, uh, Anne Frank? This girl had never read it, you know, and wow. she was 18 years old. And to not have ever read or known that this other young girl had gone through this is just mind-boggling and so sad. Yeah, that's very. I thought you were going to say yes. Are you the Dorothy or the Blanche or the Rose? Oh, I'm all of them, girl. Hey. I'll, I'll bring a wicker basket to my hookup. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I love this. Um, and you know, we forget how to read classic. Like the fact that uh, cursive is not even taught now in schools. That's all I write is in cursive because that's what I was taught. But if we forget or uh, forget how to teach how to read classic, then nobody's going to read it at all because they can't. Right. You know, it's like reading Shakespeare takes takes certain. Takes a certain uh, knowledge. All right. So, final question, and I love this because I get excited. You know, when I read the books, I always want next, next, more, more, more. Right? More, more, more. What What's next for um, both of you? I'm working on uh, a Star's Board, maybe going to TV. So, um, sorry, Michael Yuri. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> he should be Actually, in everything. Actually, he'd be great, by the way. Yeah. He's yes, so great. He's so, and he's so supportive. Like He's yeah. truly supportive uh, truly. of the theater community, uh, LGBTQ community. Uh, definitely. I have a call tomorrow about uh, second book and figuring out a uh, path forward for that. So that's those are some of the things I'm kicking around. Do you have any ideas for, for what the second book, obviously? I do. That's what the call's about, trying to nail down uh, what it'll be. Yeah, but I don't have— That's all you're going to give us? Yeah, I don't—, I don't uh, I don't have I don't have more I don't know what what the editor will will choose but he and I will uh, he has some pitches for me and I have some for him so yeah we'll see. Do you think if you had your dream like yes whatever you want to write would it be semi autobiographical or is it going to be something totally different? I do tend to uh, I did start outlining a, a semi autobiographical um, piece it still would would be fiction you know that's that's the way Carrie liked to write um, and that's the kind of stuff I really find myself loving to read mm. and um, so I do find that it's it's really fulfilling to take these sort of real life experiences and fill them with uh, fiction and imagination and and uh, and find common themes that maybe as as I was living the experiences I didn't recognize and um, so a lot like Lily, Lily and the Octopus was healing for Steve I think uh, writing in that way can be healing and, and interesting for me. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, friend. I appreciate you. Tell our audience where you want them to find you and follow you. I'm at ByronLane.com and. Uh, um, you can go there and get to all my Instagram crazy stuff. I'm actually byronlane.com, D-O-T-C-O-M, yep. on, uh, on Instagram. And I, I just love your Instagram because, like I said, you share everything. I try to, yeah. I, I, uh, sometimes I worry that I'm, I'm uh, too optimistic, but I did do a post recently where I was like, I'm not always this way. So I, I uh, it does how many likes did it get? Not a lot. Oh uh, yeah. It does. Yeah. I do do a lot of. I love uh, this question. That should yeah. be a book. How many likes did it yeah. get? Yeah, <laughs> that's the title. Yes. That's the title of your yeah your that's autobiography. Right. That's right. Um, yeah, and I'm working on a, uh, all three. I'm very lucky to have all all three books in development as as feature films. 
Um, Lily is is coming along. Um, the editor uh, is uh, was it was it Twentieth Century Fox, which was now sold to Disney. Twentieth Century is now part of the Walt Disney Company. So that we're book, all going to be Disney princesses. That at some book, point well, though yes. that, but the, Jacqueline Onassis is now. You know, this is my opportunity to make her a Disney princess. So I mean, it, it's great. So I'm very excited about that project and and the Gunkle as well. The the rights have already been picked up, and so I'm writing that screenplay. Um, I got to get got to get back to it. Isn't it funny, like your first job moving from Maine to L.A., working for a literary agent, Mm -hmm. going from that to having this kind of conversation with these studios talking about your work. So cool. Yeah, it it is, you know, and what I what I truly love about about novel writing and and publishing is is it is a, a rare industry, a rare sort of art form that values life experience. So, you know, I didn't publish my first novel until, you know, I was into my 40s and. And, um, you know, I, I'm always jealous of someone who's 25 years old who comes out of a prestigious writing program who makes a splash with the first book or something. That was not my journey. You know, I had a very circuitous route. I took, you know, all sorts of different job experiences. I was a frustrated screenwriter when I came to novel writing. And now all of a sudden I've got these three movies and I'm back and sort of back in the sort Isn't of that, film world. Yeah. And anyway, so, you know, life is a journey and uh, and you, you never know how it's going to sort of circle back on itself. And it's, you know, it's a real joy. And I wonder at this age that you appreciate all that much more that rather than some some newbie. Yeah, this age, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, no, you know what I mean. <laughs> no, me. I do. I would have been very ill-equipped to handle success in my twenties. I it just I wouldn't have you know I wouldn't have done it. I would have burned out. Mm-hmm. And so I'm grateful to uh, you know for these opportunities now. So where can people find and follow you? I'm at, at Mr. Stephen Rowley, M R Stephen Rowley, uh, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. This has been such a joy. Oh, I love like you. we talked about like everything. Alexander, we love you. Thank you. Usually the show is like this big drinking frenzy and we're like, no, but this and I'm so glad that we're ending Pride Month with this because all of these life stories make up our pride, not just being gay. Yeah. Um, and our ups and downs in life and how we deal with grief and how we move forward. Well, by the way, you know, just to, just to put a bow on this, how we've changed the culture so fast yep. is by us telling our stories. And so it is yep. really so important for queer people to tell their stories. Yep. Oh, I had so much fun, and I'm going to come visit you in Palm Springs. I'm yes. going to bring my caftan. I actually don't own a caftan, so maybe we can go caftan uh, we'll shopping. Go, we'll, uh, we'll do that, or I've got a whole closet for you. Honey, uh, hey. I have different hey. sizes, but I'll, I'll <laughs> That's the beauty of the caftan. It's <laughs> one right. size fits all. <laughs> uh, mine would fit, uh, still fit like a Speedo. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so we know uh, Pride Month might be over, but Pride uh, celebrations continue real fast. We're going to give a shout-out. SoCal, El- LA Parties is back. San Diego Pride Weekend, uh, six parties. Three locations, one epic weekend, mega pool parties, rooftop party, riches in San Diego, party plus headline talent all weekend. Tickets are at elleparties.com. And usually when I hear about these kind of parties, I'm like, oh, God, oh, no. Uh, So inclusive and so fun. And we love our partners over at elleparties.com. So San Diego Pride, that's what you're doing. Uh, That's all, folks. It's always uh, a fun Grab bag. We never know what's going to happen on, oh, on this show. You're the best. A big thank you to our fabulous guest, my engineer, Sean, Sean who's our newbie, Sean. who's is doing a good job. Woo. Oh, he can't even turn on his own microphone. That's how good he does. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Our intern, Alexis Mendez, our researcher, Mama Rose. Please like, share, subscribe so we can bring the show to you for free every week. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay sexy, stay tipsy. Until next week. Yay. Cheers. This has been another episode of On The Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Find everything On The Rocks for free at On